Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Today, though, I want to begin with a little experiment, just, just for fun. Uh, I'd like for you to suppose that you have the opportunity to ask God a question. And it can be any question that you would like to ask him. And best of all, you can be certain that you are going to get an immediate answer. None of this having to wait till you get to heaven business. You're going to be able to put the question out there because God is ready and willing to answer whatever you ask. What would you ask him? What is the burning question of your heart? I want you to take a minute and just think about that. Lock the question in your mind. Maybe jot it down on your bulletin. Earlier this week, I Googled that topic, the top questions for God. And as you might imagine, there were any number of of links that one could go to, list after list after list of of questions for God and a wide variety of questions for God. But I began to notice that among the many lists, there were a handful that each of the lists had in common. And I jotted a few of them down. And so what I'd like to do is read off some of these uh, top questions for God and If the question that I read happens to match the one that you thought of, or is somewhere in the ballpark, somewhere in the same neighborhood as the question that you have for God, just just raise your hand. Just curious to see uh, to what degree Faith Bridge is in the top 10 here with our questions for God. The, The first one across the board, every single list, hands down, was some variation of, you know, why is there suffering, evil, and pain in the world? How many of you thought that might be the question that you would want to ask God. Okay, some of you there. Uh, Question number two, what is the meaning of life? Anybody have that question? We could care less about meaning here at Faith Bridge, okay? (laughs) All right, good. Uh, What is your will for my life? Or what does the future hold for me in my life? Okay, yeah, lots of concerns about that. Is there really a heaven and a hell? Anybody? Uh, Will I see my loved ones in the afterlife? Anybody for that one? Few. Are you real? Anybody there? Uh, Which religion is the right one? Anybody there? I imagine along the way, most all of us at some point in time have thought about what it would be like to have that opportunity to just ask God whatever we wanted and, and then have an answer forth. Coming. To date, though, I've never met anybody who actually did have the chance. However, the Bible does tell a story of a man who did get the chance to do that and took full advantage of the opportunity. His name was Abraham. And this particular episode of Abraham's life is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 8. We're going to be looking at that portion of Scripture. If you need a Bible, just raise your hands. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They will be glad to give you one. While you're turning to Genesis 18, let me give you a little background on Abraham. When he had his first encounter with the God of the Bible, Abraham was 75 years old and a pagan, completely apart from the living God living in what, was, uh, what is modern-day Turkey and probably was worshiping the, the moon god who had the most unlikely name of Sin. And when Abraham has his initial encounter with the God of the Bible, God makes some astounding promises to this unknown pagan. He says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a father. Despite your advanced age, you will become a father. And even more so, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. And even beyond that, Abraham, 
This nation of which you are going to be the father will be a blessing to every other nation on the earth. As I said, at this initial encounter, Abraham was 75 years old. 24 years later, Abraham and his wife Sarah are still childless. And I'm sure it must have crossed their mind along the way that perhaps they had been forgotten. That maybe it was just a dream. But God had not forgotten his promise to Abraham. And in chapter 18 of Genesis, he comes to visit Abraham again. And if you're doing the math, you know that by now, Abraham is 99 years old. 18, beginning in verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sayas of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. Abraham walked along with them to see to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. I want us to stop right there and notice something. In most of your Bibles, uh, verse 22, the last one that we read, is probably flagged with a little footnote down toward the bottom of the page that probably says something like, Hebrew scribal tradition says, but the Lord remained standing before Abraham. A reversal of what we just read in the text. What's going on here? Why is that notation found in our Bibles? Well, thousands of years ago, the copies that were made of the Old Testament were made by hand, of course. There was no printing press. There were no copy machines of any sort. And so individuals had to make one copy after another. And the men who were charged with this responsibility were known as scribes. And scribes were exceedingly meticulous in their work. They greatly 
honored and revered the word of God. And they took great pains to make sure that they were exacting and precise in the copies that they made from one to the other. They took their jobs very, very seriously. Nevertheless, their exacting nature notwithstanding, Old Testament scholars have identified a handful of places in the Old Testament where scribes did actually dare to make a change in the text, and not an accidental change, but a purposeful change. And that's what's going on here in verse 22. The thought is this, that probably a scribe was cloistered away in his writing closet, very carefully doing what scribes do, reading the text with great care, making sure that he's making copies, which is what scribes do after all. But suddenly he comes to verse 22, and as he reads it, he does a double take. He can hardly believe what it is that he reads. Because originally he reads that the Lord remains standing before Abraham. Well, any good Jew, of course, would have known that that could not be right because to remain standing before someone uh, was the posture of a servant. A master did not remain standing before a servant. It was the other way around. And so the scribe probably thought to himself, okay, whoever it was that made this copy right here obviously got it wrong. Because God is not going to be put into the lower position. And so I'm going to make it theologically correct and change it so that it is Abraham who remains standing before the Lord. And that's how it has come down to us in our text today. I, for one, though, am persuaded that the original reading was the correct reading. Why would I say that? Because you and I have the privilege of knowing something that that very well-meaning scribe could not have known. You see, 4,000 years later, in light of the cross, you and I understand that our God not only would humble himself to the point that he would remain standing before us, our God would humble himself to the point that he would lay down on a cross and die for a broken humanity, a humanity that had rebelled against him, did not love him, had turned away from him in sin. It is for that reason that I have no difficulty imagining that in fact it was the Lord who remained standing before Abraham in the posture of a servant. And if you read it that way, it really changes everything else that follows in the story. Think about it. God has come to Abraham and has announced to him the greatest blessing that Abraham could possibly imagine. He has waited 99 years for the opportunity to become a father. And now here it is. God emphasizes that in a year's time, this is going to come to pass, even to the point of rebuking Abraham's wife, Sarah. Oh, yes, it is going to happen. That would have been blessing enough, but then on top of that, God reiterates the earlier promise that not only will I give you a son, not only will you become a father, but you're going to become the father of a great nation. And even better, that nation will be a blessing to every other nation in the world. I'm sure poor Abraham's mind must have been reeling just blown away at all of the blessings that were coming toward him. But then God does something interesting, curious. Almost, you could consider it almost a non sequitur to the story. After pronouncing this incredible blessing to Abraham, he then turns and says, but first, Abraham, I'm going to make my way down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the outcry of their evil, of their sin, is so grievous that it has actually made its way up to heaven, to where I have heard it. And I am now going down there to see if it's really as bad as it sounds. In other words, it does not sound too good at all for Sodom 
and Gomorrah. And so after presenting these juxtaposed blessings and pending judgment to Abraham, the Lord remained standing before him as if to say, Abraham, in light of what I've just told you, is there anything that you'd like to ask me? Anything at all? And this is it. I mean, this is the opportunity served up on a silver platter to Abraham. Your chance to ask Almighty God whatever it is you want to ask. And what did Abraham ask him? Well, let's read on and see. Beginning in verse 23. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if there are only 40 found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. I don't know about you, but I don't think that if I had been in Abraham's shoes, I would have clued in to the need to pray and even plead with Almighty God to the point of rudeness for the sake of a people who were so wicked that their sin had made its way all the way to heaven. I don't think my heart would have been filled with that kind of compassion and concern for other people in light of what God had just told me. I think my questions would have been much more self-centered I think if I had been in Abraham's shoes, I probably would have asked something like, well, so Lord, you, you, you tell me I'm getting a son. What, uh, what's the due date going to be? You know, what's he going to be like? T- tell me about this boy of mine. I've waited 99 years. Or uh, you, you say I'm going to be the father of a great nation. How, how great is it going to be? What, what, what sort of wonderful things will happen through this nation of mine? I think those are the kinds of questions... Those Google-oriented, self-centered questions I probably would have asked. But not Abraham. Abraham, with amazing spiritual insight and a heart overflowing with compassion, quickly puts things together in his mind and realizes a very important spiritual lesson. And that is, we are blessed to be a blessing The blessings of God do not come to his people that we might hoard them and hold them and become selfish with them. But Abraham intuited and understood in his heart, you have blessed me as a father of a great nation that I might be a blessing to others starting with the people just down the road whose judgment is sure. And he drops to his knees and begins to plead with Almighty God, even calling upon God's own character, putting it in God's face. Surely you, 
the judge of all the earth, would not do that, surely you would do right. I don't know that my heart would have been inclined in that direction. This chapter, chapter 18, friends, is a call to action for God's people today. It's not merely an interesting story about Abraham, but it is a picture of the world in which we live because Sodom and Gomorrah are a picture of the world in which we live, a world that is broken and sinful and fallen and under God's judgment. And you and I are the spiritual heirs of Abraham. Abraham did not understand it fully in the moment. That the great blessing he would ultimately receive is that the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would come through his nation. And that the Savior of the world would be the one who would rescue us from our sin and our brokenness and our judgment. And just as God said to Abraham, through you, I'm sending that blessing. So he says to each one of us today who name the name of Jesus Christ, through you I am sending that blessing. It is through you that the good news of the gospel, of the salvation of lost men and women, boys and girls, will go forth into the world. It is through you that I will be a blessing. The question, my friends, is this. If we have been blessed... To be a blessing, what are we doing with the blessing? Have we become a repository of God's blessings? A place where they land and they are enjoyed and appreciated but go no further? Or do we understand along with our father Abraham that no, God, when I realize the extent to which you have gone for me, that you would die for me, How could I possibly hold on to that which you intended me to give to the rest of the world? What are we doing with the blessing? Last month, I had uh, the privilege yet again of taking our 10th Faith Bridge team to India. And as always, God used our people to do such amazing things in the lives of others and and for his kingdom. It was a joy for me to be a part of this team. Among other things, we were able to sponsor a, a women's conference. Women in India have such a hard life. They are incredibly devalued by their culture and just the slightest touch, hug, encouragement means so much to these ladies, and and our ladies' team did a marvelous job of blessing these women. And for four days, our team was able to reach out to about 400 children out in the community, many of whom would otherwise not have the chance to fully understand how much Jesus loves them. I had the privilege of being able to work with 40 pastors. Uh, It's a great honor for me to be with these men and women and do what I can to help train and equip them for leadership, to do their part of sharing the gospel in India. It's such a beautiful country. The people are so lovely, but so many millions upon millions are lost in darkness and in sin. One of the best parts for me of these trips is the chance that I have to get to know some of these pastors personally, to become friends. And I made one such friend... uh, with a fellow by the name of Ahmad. Ahmad, uh, he's the good-looking one there in the photo. (laughs) Ahmad was uh, an amazing individual. As he shared his story with me, I became increasingly impressed with how God is using him and how he has surrendered himself to God's purposes. About five years ago, he felt as though the Lord was leading him uh, to start an orphanage for the many homeless children there in Hyderabad. And so, uh, with practically no resources, just faith and obedience, he and his family started this orphanage, and now 50 children have a place to live and clothing and food and access to education that they otherwise would not have. 
That, that was impressive enough, but the next story that Ahmad told me just convicted me right down to the soles of my feet. The caste system in India has been officially outlawed, but in many parts of the country, it is still alive and well. The, the caste system is a system of social order and rank whereby uh, individuals are born into a particular caste or rank, and that determines their worth and their value to society, to life in general. And so if you have the good fortune to to be born into a higher caste, you are an honored and revered and valuable individual. On the other hand, if you have the terrible misfortune to be born into the lowest possible caste, not only are you unworthy, And without value, you are untouchable in the literal sense of the word. And there is a spectrum between the untouchables all the way to the highest caste, fitting everyone into their proper rank in society. Well, Ahmad is not an untouchable, but he is from a lower caste. As it turns out, though, he lives in a community that is primarily populated with people from higher castes. And the two castes do not interact socially. In fact, Ahmad is not even allowed to walk down the same side of the street as someone from a higher caste. That is a terrible social offense. But nevertheless, he sat there on that bench and shared with me how he cries out to God on behalf of these higher caste people because they do not know Jesus, despite the fact that they look down their noses at him and even in some cases revile him, his heart breaks for them that they don't know the Lord. And so he began to pray fervently, asking God for some means by which he could overcome the barrier of the caste system and find a way to share Jesus with these people who didn't even want to talk to him much less be his friend. And as he prayed and he thought, an idea occurred to him one day. You see, it's a quirk of the caste system, as I understand it, that while the castes do not interact socially, they can do business together. And so he began to pray and ask God for a business idea, a platform from which he could then share the gospel with his higher caste neighbors. And one day the idea came to him One day he decided, I'm going to be an English teacher because many, many people in India want to learn English. It was just one problem in the plan. Ahmad did not know English. (laughs) Not to be deterred, though, he learned it at his own expense, his own Pace, discipline, hard work. He became an English speaker. And he didn't stop there. He then went on to become certified to teach English. And then he set up shop. And the next thing you know, higher caste neighbors who want to earn, learn English are coming to his home. And he's using the Bible, the Word of God, as one of his textbooks to teach his lost neighbors English and to teach them about Jesus. And as I listened to his story, I knew I had some hard questions staring me in the face. I went back to my room, and I had to humble myself before the Lord because the Holy Spirit was asking me, Dan, when was the last time that you went out of your way for people who don't particularly care for you? When is the last time that you sat and really thought and prayed and pled with me creatively about how to reach those people? When is the last time, Dan, that you did anything extreme, like learn another language, to tell people about Jesus? When is the last time that you Any of you did something, did anything to tell the world about Jesus?
as I thought about Amod and all that he has been willing to do and the lengths to which he has been willing to go and the tears and the prayers that he has offered up on behalf of lost people, it occurred to me that perhaps his mother misnamed him. Perhaps she shouldn't have named him Amod. I think perhaps she should have named him Abraham. I'm proud of Faithbridge Church and all that we are doing as a church to reach the world for Jesus. We're opening up new space so that children can come and hear the gospel. We're launching a new campus up in the woodlands to reach more people. We've got local ministries multiplying down south of the Beltway to reach people with the gospel. We're sending teams all over the world to drill wells, to do vacation Bible schools, to teach pastors, to build houses, you name it, we're doing it. But I also believe with all of my heart that today, August 17th, 2014, God has called us together as a congregation not to stand up and say, yay, Faith Bridge, and pat ourselves on the back over the wonderful things that we are doing, but I believe that God has called us here this day and in this hour to get on our knees and to plead and to pray for a broken world. Because you don't have to go far to see just how broken it is. You turn on the TV and you see that violence is racking the Middle East and Syria and Iraq where innocents are being slaughtered. Israel, once again, is torn to pieces with violence. Diseases like Ebola are taking hundreds, if not soon thousands of lives on the continent of Africa. There is poverty on a scale that most of us cannot begin to imagine all over the world. And even right here in the heartland of America, in Missouri... There is racial anger and tension and misunderstanding and violence. Yes, there have been troubled times before in the history of the world, and troubled times will come again, but we are in a troubled day today. And I submit to you that as men and women, boys and girls, who have received the blessing promised to Abraham, God now stands before us this morning and asks us, Is there anything, anything at all that you want to ask me? That's why I'm calling you this morning to join me down here at the altar. And as a church and as God's people, joining our hearts together for this broken world that desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to invite you, wherever you are, to simply make your way down to the front. And we're going to spend some time on our knees for this world that God loved so much. He gave his only son that we might be saved. And then after we've prayed, I'll come back and lead us in a closing prayer together. Won't you come and ask God this morning? Thank you.